Good day, and um, so good to be here with you. Another week has come and gone, and here we are together. Just thank you so much for uh, <clears throat> inviting me into your places. We are now into February, and where has January gone? And uh, wherever you are, I, I hope you are well and uh, blessed. And thank you so much again, like I said, to uh, invite me in your places. I want to begin with a question. Would you describe yourself as someone who is self-reliant? That is, you are confident in your own efforts. Let's look at this from a different angle. Do you struggle with pride? Maybe from time to time. Are you prone to rely on yourself? These are the kinds of questions that the Apostle Paul was putting to the Galatians in his letter to the churches there. Now, Marshall Segal, in his article, When Our Hearts Revert to Self-Reliance, said this about self-reliance in respect to our salvation by grace alone. He said, quote, The longer we're Christian, we can slowly and subtly, 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 here I'm struggling with that word, pardon me, begin to feel less needy. Self-reliance can creep in, corrupting our awareness of our corruptions and awakening fresh confidence in our own energy and effort. And then Segal goes on and provides four reasons in his article to, for us to be reminded to rest on the, the grace of God and, and the work of the cross and Christ alone in our lives and not in self-reliance. And uh, of course, without any uh, explanation or definition due, uh, due to time constraints here in our time together, we start with reason number one. Reason number one, Jesus had to die horribly because we sin horribly. Number two, we were converted through believing, not doing. And number three, the Spirit carries us from our first steps of faith until our very last breath. And last but not least, our sacrifices and sufferings for Jesus have not been in vain. And here's what Segal is doing here, at least this is the way I see it. He's uncovering the spiritual reality that each of us face every day from the moment we open our eyes till we close our eyes again at night. And it's best said by the words of an old hymn that goes, one line goes like this, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. A very sober, sobering reality indeed. Please turn in your Bibles to the Letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, and we're going to read together verses 1 through to 9. Verses 1 through to 9, chapter 3, Galatians. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Verse 9, So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time together in this way. And I thank you, Lord, also for the opportunity to bring your message to us, to all of us in, that are hearing and watching this. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that it would mold us and shape us to be more like your son, Jesus, and that it would bring you great glory and, uh, in our lives and through our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Five weeks ago, we began the sermon series together, Galatians for Freedom. And uh, five weeks since now, we have arrived here at chapter 3. And so far as we were able, we have covered the, the Apostle Paul's defense of his gospel uh, against those that were preaching and teaching a false gospel in the Galatian churches, a defense to his apostleship and calling to apostle as an apostle, including his audio, autobiography as we found those in chapter 1 and 2. Now Paul turns his full attention to the Galatians here at chapter 3, and he says these things in the very, in the very first verse. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he says this in a different way, again in verse 3, where he said, Are you so foolish? He said that to the Galatians. Now John Stott in his commentary on Galatians, on Galatians quotes J.B. Phillips' paraphrase of verse 1, where J.B. Phillips said this in his own words regarding verse 1 here, O oh, you dear idiots! You see, when it comes to the Galatian believers who apparently were turning from the true gospel, Paul strongly, ever so strongly, rebu rebukes them here. And this word foolish, according to the Vines Bible Dictionary, signifies a person who is senseless and unworthy and lack of understanding. And it's no wonder that Paul would say here in verse 1, uh, who has bewitched you? See, Paul was upset and, and shocked and reasons in his questions to the Galatians, uh, who has charmed you? Who has beguiled you? Who has misled you? In other words, who is leading you into evil instruction? And he follows this up in verse 1 by reminding him that before your eyes, before their eyes, that's my word, before their eyes, Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is critical in his, in his uh, uh, rhetorical uh, questions as well, as we'll read shortly. And this word portrayed uh, means that Paul, in his, pe in his preaching, was painting a picture with words, as the IVP commentary so puts it. And it's a twofold picture. On one part, we see Christ crucified in history. That's the past tense. And here in verse 1, we have this verb crucified, and it's in the present tense. And because of that, we're concerned with the present time, the present saving power of the crucified Christ for all who would believe in him. And this was a gospel message that Paul preached and the Galatians received and believed. And Paul's mind, it was just absolutely foolish, absolutely senseless on the part of the Galatians to return to the law. One commentator put it this way, to return to the graveyard. To give any credibility to these false teachers, which are called here in Galatians, Judaizers. They were adding circumcision and the Mosaic law to the gospel. And Paul says, that's foolish, that's senseless to turn to that. We go to Paul's commentary in his first letter to the Corinthian believers to understand Paul's thinking in this, his mind on this. We know that Paul was addressing other issues in that church in Corinth, and he speaks there in chapter 1 of the wisdom of Christ and the power of God. For Paul sees this preaching as folly to those who are perishing. That's in 1 Corinthians 1.18. But for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is similar to what he writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, For the gospel is the power unto salvation for the Jew and the Gentile. He goes on and says that his preaching, Christ crucified, was a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. Yet to the many of the Galatians, the Jews and Gentiles alike, Paul's preaching was Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.24 So then how really foolish, how stupid, that the Galatians would be committed to turning to spiritual betrayal, to treason. So from this sort of 
beginning this really strong rebuke, Paul then goes from verse 2 to 5, and he brings the Galatians right back to the very beginning. He brings them back to their roots, to the cross, to the crucified Christ, to the gospel. Back to the time when Paul had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and many had received and believed. And Paul does this by asking four rhetorical questions, one after the other. So let's look at those quickly. Verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing in faith? Now, I think you and I would know what that answer is. But this is the question, the rhetorical question he asks the Galatians. And let's go to his letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 17, to get the answer. There Paul said, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the words of Christ. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the words of Christ. So it goes like this. Paul preached the words of Christ. The Galatians heard the words of Christ, preached by Paul. And those who believed not only received salvation, but also they received the Holy Spirit by faith alone. By faith alone. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is at work in all these places. And we see this when Paul talks to the Corinthians again. We go back to that letter, 12th chapter, 13th verse, where he says, For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of the one Holy Spirit. You see the Spirit at work in the grace of God in, unto salvation all the time. Next question, verse 3. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This means more than body, friends. Paul here is assuming that those who by faith have received, have received Christ and have received the promised Holy Spirit, as he said to the Ephesians in that letter, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul said, And him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. So here's the point. Friends, salvation is all the work of God. The preaching of Christ crucified, the faith to believe, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in a believer, all, every bit of it, from and of God. So why would you want to turn back onto yourself, to your own efforts? Because that's what the false teachers are asking the Galatians to do. How ridiculous, Paul says, how dumb, how stupid. You couldn't save yourself if your life depended on it. For it was God in his mercy through his son, Jesus Christ, who has saved you from yourself. He is the one that has brought you from death to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is by the very same Spirit that God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. On the, by the, do you get that? That's what Paul is saying to the Galatians and to you and me. It's not circumcision. It's not the law. It's not our efforts. It's not your good deeds. It's not your self-reliance. Next question, verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Now with this verse, we have a question of interpretation. And this boils down to how we are to understand the word suffer here. Now, was Paul referring to suffering in regards to the Galatians from maybe local persecution or persecution of some kind for their, their, their trust in the gospel? Or some sort of other kind of trial or tribulation uh, or some sort of natural disaster or mishap? Was Paul referring to that kind of stuff? For the Greek word here translated by the ESV, which I am using as suffer, is used in terms of suffering, trials, and troubles in other places in the New Testament. However, this same Greek word can also be used in a positive light or positive sense. And this has support uh, concerning verse 4. 
And it seems that the context would support that Paul is pointing to the positive experiences, pardon me, that the Galatians had upon hearing and receiving the gospel by faith and receiving the Holy Spirit alongside. For example, we see one of these positive experiences. Certainly, we see this in the, in the first century church, in the beginning years of the church. We see the miracles that the Holy Spirit would have worked among them, the healings and, and all those kinds of signs and wonders to, to verify the truth and the power of the gospel itself. There's a positive thing. We see this in verse 5. You know, really what it seems to be happening here, the way Paul's putting this together, is that he's trying to shake them out of a stupor. They got themselves into a stupor because they're listening to these Judaizers, these false teachers, saying that you need Jesus plus this and this and this. And he wants to remind them of the blessings that they have received because of their salvation in, in Christ. Well, this brings us to verse 5. And the question is, the rhetorical question is, does he who supplies, and we can also uh, use the word gives here, does he who gives the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing and faith? And basically, this question summarizes up verse 2 that we've already dealt with. For all the Galatians' positive experiences, such as the miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit, and ultimately, when you think about it, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer was brought about by faith alone, not by resorting to their own efforts. Not at all. The false teachers were offering a life, really, of vain practices, which in the end would only really lead to death. I just want to press pause for a moment um, right here at the end of these uh, questions, these rhetorical questions in our text, and, and go back to the question that was asked at the beginning. Uh, would you describe yourself as self-reliant. Think about that question again. Ponder it for a minute, a second here. And by now, I hope you have grasped where the Galatians were heading if they had ignored Paul's questions, if they haven't stopped and pondered them. See, the Judaizers are offering a gospel with a mixture, if you will, and that's not a right way even to say it, but we'll just say it for today, a mixture of grace and works. Whereas the gospel that Paul offered and preached was one based on faith alone in the crucified Christ alone. You see, self-reliance was the cornerstone of the Judaizers' doctrine and teaching. That is, the way to God was obedience to the law. And a sign of that would have been circumcision. So let's think about ourselves today. Think about our context today. Um, maybe ask ourselves, what signs can we look to as warnings for ourselves that self-reliance is leading us away from the grace of God towards legalism, towards a work salvation? What sorts of signs should we be able to see or pay attention to? And I just want to give you two to consider. One is, is uh, this idea that that you believe blessings from God only come to you when you've had your, say, your quiet time. That is, you don't have your 10 or 20 minutes of reading of your Bible and prayer, you will be less blessed that day. Another way to put it is God's love for you is dependent on your Bible reading plan. Now, if this is you, then you are most likely mixing works with grace. And I want you to hear the Apostle, the Apostle Paul's words here in Galatians. In chapter 5, verse 1, Paul said this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You see, your Bible reading plan can become a yoke of slavery, believe it or not, if you believe that God's love for you depends on your reading plan. I hope you understand what that's, what the, where that means. Secondly, 
you will know you are moving away from the grace of God towards self-reliance, toward works, when you are constantly comparing. Are you constantly comparing yourself to others? And how much better you are maybe than they are or the other person is? Do you even rate the level of your goodness in comparison to another person, your holiness in comparison to another person? And by the way, we all do that. To some extent, I think, I believe. We all compare ourselves to others. So do you. That is, compare yourself to another person by how many things they do wrong compared to you, even vice versa. My friends, the thing is, God doesn't do comparison. If someone is struggling with a sin, and you are not, this doesn't make you a better person. It doesn't make you morally superior, and vice versa. It doesn't make you morally inferior if you're struggling. Uh, uh, we all struggle, my friends. We all have blind spots. We would rather see the positives in us. We, we get blinded. We have these blinders on. And I want us to be reminded of what the Lord Jesus Christ said when he said this in Matthew 7, 1 to 5. He said this, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye or your sister's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eyes? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye and sister's eye. So here's the point. Beware of self-reliance. It can and it will corrupt your view of God's grace and understanding. And if you are in that place of pride and self-reliance, it is only by God's grace and by faith alone and the crucified Christ alone, and the forgiveness he offers, that you will be able to live a life that is truly pleasing to God. Well, verse 1 to 5, Paul brought the Galatians right back to the cross, right to the foot of the cross, back to where it all started for them. And now from verse 6 to 9, Paul points the Galatians even further back, way back, 430 years before the Mosaic law was even put into place by Moses, by God through Moses, to the time of Abraham. And let's just keep it simple here. And the short and skinny of it all is God's covenant with Abraham came with two specific promises. One of descendants, the other of a land. And even before God changed Abraham's name, uh, Abraham, Abraham's name, pardon me, to Abraham, the Bible tells us that Abraham, in Genesis 15, 16, believed the Lord, believed Yahweh, and he counted him, God counted him, Yahweh counted him as righteous. Paul puts, puts it this way in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. There, there he is quoting uh, Genesis 15, 6. This was Paul's example of how God gives to someone his Holy Spirit. How God, how God saves someone by faith alone. And it tells us in verse 8 that those of faith are counted as sons of Abraham. For as Abraham was justified by faith in God, by, by the way, before the law was even put in place, the Galatians, Jews and Gentiles alike, who are of faith, these, Paul tells us, were blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Or as one commentator put it, Abraham, the believer. So why? Why did Paul appeal to Abraham? Well, I don't have time to be comprehensive here because we're, we're coming to a close here. But suffice it to say this, that salvation, according to Paul, is founded on the promise of God, not on the Mosaic law. And God's promise also is, promise of salvation is not nationalistic. That is, it's not only for Israel. My friends, the Old Testament prophetically speaks of God's promise that all families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And God calls Abraham from his country to go to another land. He said to him, 
In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 12, 3. And my friends, God was true to his word. God promised blessing of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, in the crucified Christ alone, is poured out to all people because of Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us of that in Ephesians chapter 1, where he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And further on down, he said this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, friends, whoever's listening, I don't, don't matter who you are, where you are as a Christian, you're prone to wander, you're prone to leave the God you love. That's, that's a fact, Jack. And I want to read to you from an old hymn uh, as I close. Come, thy fount of every blessing. Maybe you have heard of this hymn. Listen to the words. And remember that you are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, and the crucified Christ alone. Come thy fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, Mount of thy redeeming love. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much that you loved us first, even while we were still sinners. And you sent your one and only Son into the world for the forgiveness of all sin. And those who would believe on you and receive you would receive eternal life. Oh, Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you for inviting me in your places. God bless you. Shalom.